All right, let's do this. This episode is sponsored by Frontend Masters. They have a terrific lineup of live courses you can attend either online or in person. They also have a terrific backlog of courses you can watch, including JavaScript Good Parts, Build Web Applications with Node.js, AngularJS in depth, and Advanced JavaScript. You can go check them out at frontendmasters.com. This episode is sponsored by Hired.com. Every week on Hired, they run an auction where over a thousand tech companies in San Francisco, New York, and LA bid on JavaScript developers, providing them with salary and equity up front. The average JavaScript developer gets an average of 5 to 15 introductory offers and an average salary offer of $130,000 a year. Users can either accept an offer and go right into interviewing with the company or deny them without any continuing obligations. It's totally free for users, and when you're hired, they also give you a $1,000 bonus as a thank you for using them. But if you use the JavaScript Jabber link, you'll get a $2,000 bonus instead. Finally, if you're not looking for a job but know someone who is, you can refer them to Hired and get a $1,337 bonus if they accept a job. Go sign up at Hired.com slash JavaScript Jabber. Let's face it, bookkeeping is hard, and it's not really what you're good at anyway. Bench.co is the online bookkeeping service that pairs you with a team of dedicated bookkeepers who use simple, elegant software to do your bookkeeping for you. Check it out at bench.co slash JavaScript Jabber for 20% off today. They focus on what matters most, and that's why they're there. Once again, that's bench.co slash JavaScript Jabber. This episode is sponsored by Wrangle.io. Wrangle.io is putting on a free webinar that introduces Angular 2 components. It will be April 25th from 12 to 1 p.m. Eastern Time. To sign up, go to javascriptjabber.com slash wrangle. That's javascript.com slash R-A-N-G-L-E. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 211 of the JavaScript Jabber Show. This week on our panel, we have Amy Knight. Hello. Jameson Dance. Hello, friends. Dave Smith. Hello! I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv, and this week we have a special guest, Mike North. How's it going, guys? Now, Mike, you were introduced to me by Mark Grabansky, Front End Masters, and uh, he said lots of nice things about you and then said that you were an awesome Ember dude, and so we thought we would get you on the show, since we haven't really talked about Ember for a while. Uh, yeah, you- it's been a good while. We should. It's good to get back to it. Yeah, your last one was with uh, Eric Brin about two years ago, and oh. a lot's changed Whoa. since then. Just rub it in, why don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Ember. It's it, not you. It was non-deliberate neglect. Anyway, we are repenting of our fiendish, devilish, reactish, angularish ways. And <laughs> yeah, actually, we were all distracted by backbone. Framework. It's that's coming out any second now. Yeah, but anyway, you want to introduce yourself real quick, and then we'll start talking about uh, some of the exciting stuff that went on at EmberConf. Sure. So I'm the CTO at Levanta Financial. It's a startup based out of San Francisco. And more importantly, I am a pretty involved contributor to Ember, Ember Data, Ember CLI, a bunch of add-ons in the ecosystem. And I do a lot of training, workshops, speaking uh, about Ember and about you know opinionated frameworks and how you can ship soon and uh, not worry about you know reinventing the wheel as much as you can. That means you know Stanley Stewart probably, right, if you're on the I, Ember data team? I'm not on the Ember data team, just to be clear. I'm not on a core team or anything, but I do. Um, I'm sort of like the trainer dude that goes around and conducts a bunch of workshops at the conferences. Like Steph Penner and I just did a big training at EmberConf on uh, state management, and I'm good with the educational side of things, but don't have time to get involved at the core team level. Well, Stanley is awesome, if you He's do great. or don't know him. Oh, you do? No, okay. I do know him. He's, he's fantastic. But he's yeah. even more hands-on than I am, for sure. <laughs> I get people asking this all the time. I mean, most of the noise out there is about React and Angular that I'm hearing these days. And I'm like, yeah, but Ember does some cool stuff. And some of the other frameworks out there, Cycle.js looks really cool. you know. And I'm like, you definitely should look at them. So what's kind of the big direction that we're seeing with Ember you know, as compared to React or Angular? Right. So the way I like to think about it is there's a certain portion of the apps that we build that is common, right? Like the idea of uh, syncing data with DOM, pretty much everyone agrees that there's no value in us each as 
you know, developers of products tackling that problem individually. It's not a unique problem we have. It's a common problem. And uh, React believes that we can all build around React and we can just deal with, you know, manipulating our data and it will take care of updating the DOM for us. Angular, to a greater extent, says, all right, you know, especially with Angular 2, we've got routing, we've got controllers, we've got all of the stuff that, you know, is the framework, right? That they're, they're common pieces of boilerplate that we can build on top of and define our product, you know, from there up. Ember is probably the most opinionated framework, uh, at least for building browser-based apps out there. And if we wanted to put numbers on this, it might be React feels like we're 50%, you know, 50% of our apps are the same Angular might be like 80% of our apps are the same, and Angular might be 80% of the apps are the same, and uh, Ember might be 95%. Just and when you, when you say the same, do you mean like 95% of an Ember app is going to look a lot like all other Ember apps, or do you mean 95% of Ember apps look really similar to each other? I'm saying that there are bigger assumptions, greater assumptions about what is boilerplate versus what do you have to implement by yourself as a developer. Mm. So I was just uh, listening to one of your older podcasts about Aurelia, where the idea is to, mm -hmm. uh, Rob was talking about decoupling you know, the framework from your app code and being sort of insulated from framework updates. Um, the idea here is the framework is your ally and it should do as much as possible within reason. And that's sort of the whole, you know, convention over configuration thing where things should just kind of work out of the box and you should have to write very little code and have the framework do almost all of the work. And Ember does this when it comes to routing or the, you know, component layer or even talking to your API when we're, we're thinking about Ember data. The idea is, you know, things should just work if you align with conventions and there are hooks to deviate from those conventions if you need to. Makes sense. Sorry, I just heard a phone ring. I'm not sure if that was... Yeah, that was me trying to get Amy back in. I, oh, yeah, I, I have no idea what's going on. Can you guys hear me now? Yep. yep. <laughs> okay, that, like, I don't know. It got disconnected and it kept telling me to join and mm -hmm. I don't... Even though I could hear you guys. Anyways. It's Microsoft's fault. <laughs> Carry on, I'll be quiet. <laughs> So can you give an example of what you mean, by Mike, by uh, convention over configuration? Right. So in a lot of apps, you have a route or a page that will show a list of records versus a route that will show a detail view for one record. So you have a master detail view. That kind of thing just works out of the box with Ember, even to the extent of when you obey a particular naming convention, it will retrieve the record that matches that naming convention. And uh, that is your starting point. Your, your sort of ground floor is much higher up in terms of even fetching the data and you know connecting a template with a controller and all of that is done for you. Whereas in the React world, which is probably the best thing to contrast with it, it's a lot more DIY. And we see mm -hmm. that while it's a very powerful piece of technology, there is some fragmentation that the React community is Oh, yeah. um, having to deal with a little bit. The Ember world, all of our apps are like 99% aligned to the point where you can take a developer from one team or one company, move them to another Ember app, and they're productive within an hour or two because they know exactly how things are structured. And that attribute that you're describing where you could, you know, the structure is consistent across teams building Ember apps, that seems to be orthogonal to the concept of convention over configuration and more like Ember is got like a broader reach when it comes to the opinions that it has. You know, React, what you talked about is like, well, we only have opinions about your view. We don't have opinions about your controller logic or your data or anything. But Ember has opinions about all of it, right? Is that of everything, generally? yes. Yep. Um, Ember has opinions about build tools and the, you know, to the extent that we all use Babel. We were all using Esperanto for particular things, you know, until Babel was our module transpiler. So we're all using the same stuff, and that gives us a very high degree of interoperability where, especially with the add-on ecosystem, you can install something like Cordova or Electron with one line. And mm -hmm. because we know all of the apps use the same tooling, even talk to APIs in similar ways, we can get people started a lot more quickly than we could if we had to worry about a lot of fragmentation and differentiation between apps. So does this explain why every Ember developer I've ever met has the same color socks? <laughs> no, that's, that, that's a separate thing, but that's I'm not allowed to talk about it. That's configuration, not convention. The, 
<laughs> yeah, that's the first rule of Sock Club is I'm not supposed to talk about Sock Club. So. <laughs> that really destroys their uh, Socks subscription service business model. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> not sure how they get more customers if that's their marketing mm. strategy. So you already mentioned it a little bit. Do you want to talk about some of the changes that have been happening in Ember recently? Because Ember is, is pretty old, right? It's like five years old or something, which is yeah. sure. a yeah, dinosaur it's, it, in JavaScript front-end framework. Years. Yeah, it's been able to stay relevant for a remarkably long time, especially in an area of engineering that seems to totally reinvent itself every two years. Yeah, I so, said dinosaur. I didn't mean dinosaur as in like, oh, it's so old. It's more like... Oh, no, no. I mean, it's been around long, for a while. Yeah, it does. It's so the pedigree reason. the pedigree starts with like uh, with iCloud and MobileMe, which Apple built on a framework called Sprout Core, and a lot of the developers that were involved, you know, beyond like into the days where it was called Ember and after it was called Sprout Core, right? So the first commit into Ember was Sprout Core 2's source code being brought over into the open source world. So a lot of developers kind of went along with it and made that transition. So it started at Apple, and it's what they used for building this very rich sort of office suite plus webmail plus calendar. It's a, it was almost like Apple's flavor of Google Docs. Uh, and it actually still exists today, iCloud.com, if you wanted to check that out. But it, it's very rich, and Apple aimed to make this such a almost an experience that transcends what people expect of the web. A lot of animations, uh, no browser default stylings. It's very iOS looking. And because it was so complex and involved all of this functionality, they needed to basically build a framework underneath it. And at some point, it was spun off into a separate you know, organization that was working on Sprout Core. And as they started building Sprout Core 2, they decided they were going to kind of rebrand it a little bit and you know, take a fork and turn it into Ember. And that's what we're working with today. So, so the roots go all the way back there. Now, what's been happening over time is we've first aimed for productivity, and that's the number one priority in the Ember world, that people are able to get up and running, they're able to share code, that the same abstractions you use for building a small application, they survive all the way up to a very complex application. And uh, when I was working at Yahoo, which that was the, the last job that I had where you know, we had over a dozen Ember apps and uh, I had a few hundred Ember developers um, working in the ads and data division, at least people that were using it, you know, part-time or full-time, but we, we were able to, you know, start small and then, you know, teach those same best practices as the apps got to be over 100,000 lines of JavaScript code, um, which is pretty impressive. You know, whenever I've worked with the JavaScript framework or even with server-side frameworks, there's a point where you're sort of in small app mode and then have to transition into big app mode, and there are different rules for you know, dealing with things and for handling that level of complexity. So recently, the big thing has been, all right, we have the productivity, we have these amazing build tools. Ember CLI has been like a huge win over the past year. And it's great to see even the uh, Angular CLI, which is going to be the build tool for the Angular 2 world that shares a lot of the same stuff that Ember CLI uses. That I think they actually still bring Ember CLI in as a dependency. That's a great thing for all of us to rally around. But now we can start focusing on the things that people complain about when they you know, were using the old Ember. And one of them is performance, right? We had a big performance problem and we mm -hmm. started to lose people to the React side when you know, there was a need to have you know, huge numbers of components on the screen updating continuously. We were not strong in that area. And with the you know, release of Glimmer in the last year and the upcoming Glimmer 2, we're sort of hitting back in a big way there. We, hey, we got a demo. I haven't heard of Glimmer. Can you tell us what that is? Sure. So the idea with Ember is you're writing handlebars templates. Those are compiled at build time, right? They're turned into imperative instructions for building some DOM. And then your user downloads them and, you know, the HTML is rendered on the screen. Glimmer is the layer that not only compiles those templates, but handles, you know, updates whenever data changes. It's sort of the React piece of the framework, if you want to think of it that way. And the cool thing is we can swap this out. We can make improvements in this black box that are sort of, uh, this is, you know, opaque to the developer. We can make massive improvements here, and it should be a drop-in, you know, replacement as people upgrade their version of the framework. They'll just bring in the new version of Ember, and now you know, we'll see a massive performance boost just by 
improving this thing under the hood glimmer. And there is a Glimmer 2 now being worked on, right? Yes. Glimmer 2 is supposed to be released with Ember 2.7, and it's basically a total rewrite. The cool thing here is that we're shrinking template size by like 80%, and the speed at which we're able to render stuff on the screen and re-render it for huge numbers of components, it looks like it's, it not only competes with what can be done with React, but surpasses it. And uh, this is not to say that it's one-upsmanship here, but we were able to learn from the lessons of React and, you know, take other things into consideration as, you know, as this was built out. So it's some, some really exciting stuff. We're starting to see things get rendered so fast that we're hitting an artificial limit within browsers where it just will not render faster than 60 frames per second because it's sort of pointless to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I saw that in uh, Tom and... Yehuda's uh, keynote at Emmerconf, and they were like, oh, it just goes to 60, and that's it. Yep, yep. It's like buying a BMW, and it can only go 150 miles an hour because what's the point <laughs> going above that? <laughs> well, if you have Jedi reflexes. Yeah, yeah, then yeah, you exactly. take off the limiter or whatever. <laughs> a friend of mine recommended we talk to you about, uh, is it Ember Fastboot? Because if I understand correctly, before you could not do server-side rendering with Ember, but is this enabling that now? So it's a separate project. I'm happy to talk about Fastboot. Um, there are a couple of parallel efforts here. One is Glimmer 2, and another is Fastboot, and that is LinkedIn and Bustle have been putting a lot of sort of sponsorship resources towards this through, you know, paying for core team members to work on it full time. Um, This is another example of being not the first to the party with a feature like server side rendered, you know, HTML from a single page app framework. But I think it's been done in a really thorough and really well executed way. Uh, And the idea here is you just install an add on and there's a Node.js layer with a an abstraction of the DOM that is not like JS DOM, which is a full implementation, but a very lightweight version of the DOM that allows us to quickly render and cache things and then serve it up from a little express server. And this is addressing one of the big concerns with using a single page app at all, and that's the first, you know, the first page render, right? What is your initial user experience as someone starts to use your product, how quickly does that first page load? Server-side rendering really helps with that. Now, the state of things now is that the server-side will spit out rendered HTML, and then the client-side will kind of clobber that and start the show over on its own. And this is all transparent to the user. From their point of view, everything appears to load you know, very, very quickly. Where we're hoping things will go is that we'll be able to do something called rehydration, which is where uh, the client side will sort of just connect to what the server side has rendered and pick up from there instead of sort of boiling the ocean and re-rendering everything again. Sounds super cool. Yeah. And by the way, quick plug here, I've been writing a series of articles on setting up a, like a single page app and API system with Elixir, Phoenix, and Ember Fastboot. I've been releasing about an article every week. And by the time this podcast is released, it should be a good resource for people to start from scratch Mm -hmm. and get a Fastboot app with like material design and server and client side, you know, validation and, you know, all of that good stuff you know, step by step, starting from scratch. That is like an ultra modern stack that you just described. Yes. Very sort of real timey in that, you know, everything's synced up um, with ultra, ultra low latency. And uh, the idea is to take two opinionated frameworks and align their conventions so that you can be, you know, super, super productive across the whole stack. So um, I know Amber, you already mentioned it a little bit. And it was a, about a month ago, I think. Do you want to Talk a little bit about some of the things that came out of that. You already mentioned one or two of the things that came out of the keynote, but I, I think there's other things that might be interesting to talk yes. about. Yeah. So one interesting thing is we got to see, and I'm not, again, I love React. I'm not trying to pick on React, and I, I'm sorry if it comes off as, as uh, seeming that way, but not React enough. Conf preceded EmberConf by a short couple of weeks, I think, and even the people who advocate most strongly for React were kind of, or some of them at least, were kind of surprised at the focus on React Native. And so during the keynote, we saw like a side-by-side comparison of 
two experiences during Tom and Yehuda's talk. Ember and, native? And, no, the, the no. point is there is no Ember native. <laughs> the point is that, that all of these interstitial interruptions, right? That's what interstitial means, uh, where you ask your user to download a native app. Those uh, are just really, really bad in, in almost every way. And now even, you know, Google is there crawling through content. They're penalizing people that are putting these, you know, prompts to download the native app in place instead of having a mm. decent mobile web experience. So Ember's positioning itself as the SDK for the web. They, I believe, use the exact term, there will be no Ember native, right? We're just going <laughs> for the web. We're targeting the yeah. browser. Uh, we're focusing on that. Ember is the SDK for the web. That's the new tagline. And the idea here is, especially for clicking that first link, right? If you send a Yelp link to your friend and they don't have the app installed, it's honestly a really terrible experience when you click on it and you, you can either choose between like the mobile web experience that they had like one guy invest like, you know, three or four months on and then stop. It's very, very basic. Or you have to download like, 108 megabytes of Swift code over your, you know, LTE connection. You sort of really have two bad choices there. And what we're learning is both of those are bad. What you see is a huge drop off in engagement and you don't really see a major bump in terms of app installs. So what we're focusing on is just making really performant in-browser applications that approach the level of richness people expect when they use a native app. And that's going to be through lowering the size of your deployed app through using server-side rendering to get that first page on the screen quickly through using things like app cache which i know is apparently a douchebag but it, it's still broadly supported so we're you know app cache is still for some things a reasonable thing to use service workers are huge and very promising in terms of letting us build things more richly and with more offline support so all of these things pave the way for the web moving from being like a document viewer or the browser being a document viewer to being an application platform. This is just a shim until we get there. So I thought that was pretty funny how Tom and Yehuda said, you know, it's funny how we get crap when we ship a 300 kilobyte web app to a mobile device, yes. but then we turn around and say, instead, install this 30 megabyte native app, which yes. I thought was hilarious. No uh, problem. Just download, <laughs> like use half of your data limit to you know, update this app. <laughs> Honestly, there are companies that are on the one hand, you know, saying this, like, let's slim down the JavaScript payload as much as possible, which is great. And then the mobile team is saying exactly that. Basically, through saying download this mobile app, they don't care about data. And the point is not to, like, rip on native apps, but to really say the mobile web has its place, and especially with Google penalizing content that just tries to shove people into a native experience, we got to start paying attention to it, and it's not going away. <laughs> so it sounds like, um, in some ways, by emphasizing the, the web experience, do you think there's kind of an implicit assumption that by avoiding splitting their focus into the native and the web versions of the framework that they'll be able to make more progress? Is that kind of a message behind it that you're getting with? I think maybe it's not about the split in focus in terms of like being able to keep efforts channeled in one direction, but we can keep our priorities aligned. So, for example, if React and React Native have to keep some sort of alignment, that may limit them in some way. And it's, it's nice to know that Ember is dedicated for the web, and if you're building for the web, it is pointing in this singular direction, and that's the path forward. And particularly when we look at the commitment to make upgrading easy and keeping pace with the framework easy, I think the message that we're getting is have confidence and bank on making this choice and it will be a continued ally for you as the web evolves. One other thing that I just want to point out is that in a lot of cases when I'm looking for something on the web, I mean, I open up Chrome or Safari on my iPhone and I do a search and I'm going to wind up on a web page. And if you degrade my experience simply by having this big thing flash up that says, you're not going to be able to use this because it's not mobile friendly, so go get the app, you do lose people. And that's not, to say, that's not to say that you can't split your focus in a company, but also um, I really like the idea behind Ember being sort of focused on, look, we're just going to do web. We're going to nail web. We're going to make it the best experience for web so that when people build web applications, then they can 
you know, those applications are going to have good user experience. And overall, the people who are then using the framework are going to have that benefit. And I don't know that you necessarily need a native experience, you know, for Ember or not. And if people really want it, then Ember's open source and they'll go build it. But, yep. you know, I really like the focus on the Ember core team for this. I mean, the flip side is, is that I really am kind of excited about the idea of using something like native script and Angular or React Native to go build my native apps. But that being said, I could go learn Swift, and I don't see that that's really that much worse than having to figure out how to use my framework in a sort of different environment. Yeah, I totally agree there. And and if Google is seeing like a 70% drop off in engagement, that's 70% of people encountering that prompt to download the native app and just shutting their browser off. If they're seeing that, what hope does like a new startup with no big brand trust behind them have? It's a huge, huge problem that people don't seem to understand how severe this drop-off is, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And, and the point is not that we should avoid writing native apps, but that the idea of hybrid apps is sort of coming back. The idea of having a performant experience in the browser is very real and very alive. And most people don't need the native functionality you know, that people would typically reach for something like Swift or Android or Cordova for. Like if you're building Facebook, for example, and it's just sending messages and viewing content and uploading a video and uploading a picture, most of that functionality can be done pretty well on the mobile web. Mm -hmm. And to be fair, I stopped using the native Facebook app months ago. I've just been using their native web and it's great. There you go. So I do want to push this button a little bit more, though, with high, or with mobile apps, uh, or with uh, mobile experience, I should say. You know, what is Ember doing to make that easier? I mean, you did mention that they're, you know, they're working on payloads and they're they're making uh, Glimmer faster. Is that all there is to it? Because it seems it seems like making something mobile friendly is a little bit more involved mm -hmm. than just that. And it's that actually quite a bit more involved. In, into the question that I wanted to ask also, which is you mentioned server side rendering and you talked about fast boot, but then you also mentioned service worker. Can you explain how service worker plays into that? So let me answer the first question first here. So regarding mobile, there is a lot more to it than just, you know, reducing the payload. And one thing to remember is that even in just the last four years, uh, if we just look at something like a Geekbench CPU benchmark, mobile devices are 10 times faster. Like the ones you would buy today are 10 times faster than the ones you would buy four years ago. Things like Service Worker allow us to do things in the background, right? They let us, uh, and, and this is not an official direction that Ember is going in right now because Mobile Safari does not support Service Worker yet. We hope it will one day. We can't build on things that absolutely require Service Worker if we're attempting to target that browser. But the idea is browsers are better. The JavaScript runtime is better than it was several years ago when people sort of uh, when we had like the Sentia Touch and the jQuery mobile experiences that just, let's just say, exclusively disappointed their users. And I'm talking <laughs> about like t tap the drop down, wait three seconds and finally see which toppings you can add to your pizza, like that kind of experience. We're not in those ages anymore. And we also understand much better how JavaScript performance works under the hood. So I know that uh, people like Stefan Penner on the Ember Core team have been working closely with the the V8 team in terms of making sure that we can lead developers down a path where more of their code will remain optimized and will, where it will be performant and where we can ensure that, you know, we set them up to go down a path of success with whatever degree we can using conventions and opinions in sort of the Ember ecosystem. So we're talking about mobile optimization. Does this affect hybrid apps? So in terms of hybrid app versus running in a mobile browser, it's basically the same for us. But we do have to teach people and to set them up for being successful when dealing with things like intermittent connectivity and you know avoiding CSS reflows. We saw a great talk at EmberConf by Alex Blom, who's been working on the Cordova support within Ember. Um, you know, teaching us what's expensive on a mobile device. What can you do to steer clear of this lag that people expect from a hybrid app? And a great example he pointed out, which I didn't know, was when the the keyboard slides up, that actually changes the dimensions of your viewport, right? It's like shrinking the size of your window rather than sliding up on top. And that causes a reflow, and that can end up right at that moment where the user is about to interact, you know, causing a little bit of a skip 
And, you know, being aware of these things and providing little performant pieces that people can just plug into their app and use, that's one great thing we can use to our advantage in the Ember world because we can just build the right keyboard plugin that steers clear of this problem and then everyone sort of rallies around that. I, I have the same question, but for Electron. Awesome. So Electron is much less of a hot point here because we've been building for desktop class browsers for ages here. Oh, right. There's it's a much, Chromium instead of it's Safari Chromium. or whatever. Electron works beautifully, and I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but I think it's Felix Reisberg. I hope I didn't butcher that. An open source dude from Microsoft. Great talk on Electron. He's an Electron contributor, and he kind of demonstrated how you can tap into native functionality. But again, you know, we've been using things like Spotify and Slack and Atom, all of which are you know, hybrid apps under the hood. And a lot of people, for example, use Spotify and have no idea about this. So that's a little bit less difficult of a problem because desktop browsers are pretty performant and we know how they work and we can work on them pretty easily. I think we kind of talked our way around, okay, what is Ember and what are kind of the innovations here and and what's interesting that's going on in the Ember world. But what I'm really curious about is, EmberConf isn't for people like me where I kind of dabble, you know, I, I kind of get into Angular 2 for a while, and then I kind of get into uh, native development with Swift for a while, and then I get into Elixir for a while, and then I get into something else for a while. You know, it's, it's for those people who are out there day in and day out writing Ember code. So what did the Ember people who showed up to the conference really get excited about? I mean, some of this stuff, I'm sure, but... But what were kind of the one or two things where they they heard about it and they were like, oh, wow, they really do hear us and know what our problems are? So I think it was great to see the open source mentality applied to the community, right? Empowering other people to contribute. That's a huge deal in the Ember community. And we saw a new like a mini core team built around Ember CLI, Ember Data, which is our data persistence library, and Ember Learning, and they're charged with dealing with the documentation and uh, tutorials and making yeah, sure you, that... Can you talk a little bit more about the Ember Learning team? That was really interesting to me as an outside yeah. observer. So in in our in the Ember ecosystem, uh, they consider even a lack of documentation or confusing documentation to be on par in terms of severity with a framework bug. And that is because productivity requires that you be able to understand what you're working with. And a great effort was taken by people like Trek, who was a core team member, he's now like an alumni, I guess, in rehashing the documentation and making it really easy for people to, you know, go through this learning curve and understand how to build with a UI framework oriented for single page apps. And this is a big deal for people, right? Especially if you're coming from the world of Backbone and jQuery widgets, which at least a couple years ago, that was sort of the baseline UI developer knowledge. We got away with a lot of sloppy stuff for many, many years where we got to click a link and boil the ocean and never worried about unregistering a listener that we registered. And, you know, because everything was sort of a hard reset every minute or so. In the single page app world, of course, things are, are different. And I think that Ember has a little bit of a reputation of being difficult to learn. My experience having taught dozens and dozens of people is that it's more about unlearning those bad habits and about, you know, coming up to par with what people who develop in the back end or for, you know, native apps, they've had to deal with the whole time, you know, manage your memory, be aware of performance, that kind of thing. So learning and documentation is charged with helping make sure everything is easy, everything is consistent, and people can find good information and be successful, you know, as easily as possible. That's really cool. Now, I believe that Mark said that you recorded a course for front end masters. I did. Oh, I'll totally plug that for Mark. So I think that he was getting a lot of calls, a lot of demand for an Ember course. And I had just kind of developed a big chunk of material. And I'd been teaching people at Yahoo for months and months. We adopted Ember as our standard tech stack there about two years ago for many, many, many apps. So Mark reached out to me and we spent two days going through 
got just about everything. Falling short of customizing Ember CLI and that kind of thing, which I hope I'll get a chance to do with him later this year. But you can go on frontendmasters.com, sign up, check it out. It's it's about nine hours long course with nice little delineated chapters. You can digest it at your own pace, but it at least when I gave it last December, was totally up to date. So everything you learn um, should be absolutely applicable to using the latest version of the framework today. I guess my question is, is what would you add to it based on what you saw at Emberton? Right. So so there are a couple things that I wouldn't have been able to do because they were still works in progress. Um, One of them is fast boot, the server-side rendering stuff. There are a couple things you have to be aware of when dealing with server-side rendering. And, you know, one being you can't use things like local storage. And so the typical approach to authentication, we would have people put like a JWT in local storage. You can't do that anymore because the server has no knowledge of that. Um, So I would kind of steer people more towards a a, uh, server-side rendering friendly path. But other than that, the goal is you should be able to do what you've been doing and use the plugins you've been using with no interruption. And Fastboot should just be something you turn on and the framework and the plugins should just kind of handle the rest and insulate all of that complexity for you. Of course, that all assumes you have JavaScript on the back end, right? So the idea is you have an API, right? You already have an API. And in, in the case of this little learning trail I've been building, I'm using Elixir and Phoenix. And then you'll have basically an asset serving layer that will be Express on top of Node, of course. And that will serve up your index.html. And potentially, you can have it serve up your assets as well, like your CSS and your JavaScript. People typically want to pull those in from a CDN. But this is really like a mini server just for server-side rendering that your users are hitting. It's not your real backend. Makes sense. Yep. Yeah, we've had similar conversations with the Angular Universal team. And it sounds like the approach is very similar as well. So cool stuff. Yeah, it, it's really promising. We're seeing new stuff come out every day from Ember Fastboot. And there's sort of a core, not not an official core team, but a team of developers that's sort of meeting with Tom Dale, who's the point person there. And they're iterating, you know, remarkably quickly. I expect that in the next two months or so, we will see a 1.0 release. And at that point, it should just be pluggable with all of the add-ons you've been using. You'll just be able to sort of set up server-side rendering and it should work with the majority of apps out there. One other question that I have, and this is something that comes out of the conferences, is that, so I go to, I'm go. i going to NGConf next week. I've been at several other conferences, you know, this year. And one of the biggest things for me at the conferences, besides leveling up, I guess, on my technical knowledge or, you know, any other practices, is the community. Can you kind of give us a, a thumbnail sketch of what the Ember community is all about? Like, what's it like being at EmberConf? with other developers who are doing the same thing you are, I, I find that there are different nuances to different programming communities like Ruby or JavaScript. You know, the communities are different. Angular's uh, community is different. I went to build conference this, this year and there were a lot of exciting things there, but the Microsoft developers kind of look at the world differently. So what is it? Wh- what's that lens for Ember developers? Like who are you going to see there? How does the community react to new people, to veterans? Are there heroes? Kind of how, how does that all fall out? Good question. I think the Ember community is one of the great strengths behind Ember. And you see people being very welcoming to newcomers. I know that uh, we have a couple of the heroes in the community, I guess, the people who you know, have been around for years and have add-ons with hundreds and hundreds of stars. They do pre-pair programming with new people to try to make sure uh, everybody can get up and running easily. I think we all take great pride in making it as easy as possible to get started. And we recognize that the bigger the community we have, the more we'll be able to take advantage of each other's work, right? This high degree of interoperability means, like, if I can help teach, you know, five or six dozen Ember developers, some of them are going to write some really great code that I can take advantage of in my app. And so we have a vested interest not just as friendly people, but a vested interest from like a business and from a productivity standpoint to grow the community and to help people become successful and to make sure that everything is within reach. One of the big differences between Ember and Angular and React is that there is no big company in charge of Ember, right? I mean, it came from Apple, 
right? originally as Sprout Core, but now no one company has control over the direction things will go in. And I think that it's great to see the sort of open source mentality and this this mentality of empowering people to help each other, you know, not only take place in terms of giving people the ability to contribute code, but contribute teaching or contribute translations to the documentation. A lot of people are getting involved and, and it's great to see, you know, even people that have been contributing or who have been using Ember for like six months start to open issues in the framework and to open even basic pull requests into fixing little, you know, nuanced bugs in Ember. It's great to see that we're encouraging that kind of level of openness. I just thought it was like absolutely incredible. I had two friends, one closer friend who spoke at EmberConf, Bridget Werner, and then another girl from where I am in Baltimore. And I was just amazed when I went to look up them at the speaker list, like how many newer developers there were and how many, I guess, because once you do start including newer developers, you kind of fall into like more female developers. And it kind of made me jealous of the community. Like, I just thought that was absolutely amazing. There is a huge amount of support for female developers in particular. And although there are many people to thank, Leah Silber, who is Yehuda Katz's wife, is a huge advocate for making sure that, you know, we have uh, great female speakers and that we have mentorship and we have um, at the conference an environment where every, everyone can feel comfortable. She's been a, a huge champion for making sure that you know we can cultivate these great female engineers. One of my favorites, Lauren Tan, who works at Dockyard, gave a great talk. Another Dockyard female engineer, Estelle, who built some of the foundational stuff for building desktop apps with Ember, gave another talk. And it's great to see these people emerge as leaders. I think we do have sort of more more than our share of very visible female engineers in the Ember community. I just think that's absolutely awesome. And it probably does go back to a little bit what we talked about at the beginning, like the convention over configuration, you know, definitely helps to like kind of funnel people into that community too. But this is just awesome. I think it may have started there, but it, it certainly doesn't hurt to have people start emerging as visible leaders and having these sort of people who've already gotten there and made it um, yes. and helping lift other people up. I mean, it's just fantastic to see that. Yeah. All right. Well, I know people have a time crunch, so I'm going to push us into picks. Uh, Before I do that, though, I just want to quickly mention what a great time it was seeing everybody at NGConf since uh, this will come out after NGConf. I also want to mention that I'm going to be in Chicago on July 9th. I'm going to be there for Podcast Movement, which is the 6th through the 8th. So if you want to hang out, join the mailing list is really the best way to do that. I'm going to be putting up a page for that. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. This should come out shortly before or sometime in May or June. I'm not sure when, but yeah, check that out. So anyway, let's go ahead and do picks. Dave, what are your picks? Oh, I knew you'd come to me first. I actually, I don't have any picks. (laughs) Sorry. Hey, how about that NGConf? That was great last week, huh? (laughs) (laughs) All right, Jameson, what are your picks? I have several. Uh, My first pick is React Rally Tickets. I'm the co-organizer of it. It's a React conference in Salt Lake City in August, and they're on sale right now. So go to reactrally.com to check those out. We would love to see you there. That's the end of my like self-serving tooting my own horn picks. Um, toot toot. Yeah, that's the sound. Um, well tooted. My other pick is a, a podcast called Embedded. It's an NPR podcast where they take a news story that you probably heard a little blurb about if you follow the news but maybe didn't get that much detail on and they just stick a reporter on it for a while and you get this kind of in-depth look into something that you maybe only heard about in passing Um, they've had a couple really good episodes one of them was about there was that biker shootout that happened in texas several months ago and they look at like how could that even be a thing that happens and what were their motivations and what actually happened and it's it's fascinating and then i think my last pick is a blog post called a debugging thought process a few weeks maybe a month ago this woman named una who who runs a tech podcast i think it's called tools day um about developer tools she had some like really weird performance issue in Chrome that was a little bit baffling. She just tweeted like, hey, does anyone want to look at this? And this guy named Remy, who's an experienced 
engineer who, who has a lot of experience with performance issues, he looked at it and he wrote up his process for debugging it. And I think that's more interesting than the specific problem of what actually was wrong. Just a really detailed, like, how to approach performance problems right up. So those are my picks. All right, Amy, what are your picks? Okay, I have two. The first one is also a new podcast. It's called uh, Nash DevCast. So I love Nashville and the November conference, and uh, that's where I went to my boot camp, so, uh, and family's close by. So I just love the community there. The JavaScript community especially is amazing. So I would recommend listening to that. I listened to uh, part of the first episode this morning, and it actually was like really, really good. So not just that they're friends, but I actually really, really liked what they were talking about. The next pick, I'm going to say the title of this and just hear me out before you start jumping to conclusions because I have an explanation for the title. But it is a blog that somebody emailed me who wrote it and we just kind of talked back and forth a bunch about it. And if you read the post, I feel like there are good points in there. So you might just need to uh, get over the title quickly. But it's called uh, JS Developers Who Don't Know What Closure Is Are Fine. And so I will say that I don't necessarily think that, like, that's fine uh, for more than a short amount of time. But <laughs> fine if for you five read, minutes. <laughs> if you and then read we start the judging article, you. <laughs> if you read the article, I think the main point is just that, you know, especially because I just really, like, have a heart for uh, people getting started in the industry. And, you know, I was one of those, like, very short while ago. Like, you have to start somewhere, and the sooner I feel that companies can kind of, like, leverage these people that are really, really hungry and eager to learn, the better. And so this article, like, also talks about something that I've kind of spoken on a little bit, just that it's partially, you know, the company that does hire the juniors, there are some big bonuses there, but you are going to also have to put in a little bit of time mentoring. And that is part of like your responsibility as well. So this article just kind of like goes back and forth on those things. So I think it was worth the read. So I wanted to pick that. And that's it for me. All right. I've got a few picks here. So lately, nobody shoot me. I've been doing some WordPress development. I know everybody just gagged, right? Now, the reason is, is that I went to MicroConf and I kind of got convinced that I should move all of the podcasts back to WordPress. And uh, anyway, it's been kind of an interesting ride, and I'm not going to go into all the details there, but there have been a few things here that I'm finding that are really helpful. So I'm just going to shout those out. I know there are some WordPress people you know, who do WordPress development, and it's really a great platform, and it does a lot of what I need. Anyway, what it basically boiled down to was I fiddled around with it for like four to six hours during you know free time around the conference. And I was able to get done in WordPress what took me about a year, year and a half to do in Rails, just because it already has a lot of the stuff that I need. So I decided, well, if the maintenance on it is that much more efficient, you know, this is just my particular use case, then I should go ahead and make it happen. So anyway, so I've been basically tailored a theme. I've built my own plugin that pulls in data types for shows and forums and stuff and uh, plugged in a few plugins, and it has been awesome. So the tool that I'm using to do the development, I've been using Sublime Text, actually, to write the PHP, and that's actually been pretty nice. I didn't want to try and figure out how to make Emacs play nicely with it, and it just didn't out of the box with my setup, and I'm sure it's just some custom thing that I have in there. But anyway, so uh, that was nice. Desktop server is what I'm using to host it on my Mac. And it sets up a custom domain name. So for me, it's devchat.dev. And then it does a bunch of other stuff. And then I've been using MemberPress to set up some of the other stuff. I plan on moving the conferences over too and using MemberPress for that. So overall, it's been really great. I'm super excited about it. I should have it launched next week as we speak, which means that by the time this goes out, it'll already be a few months or a few weeks before you actually see it. So anyway, it's just kind of been interesting. Mike, what are your picks? Right. So first, because Merck recommended me, I got a plug for deadmasters.com. It's a great place to find video tutorials for, you know, React and Angular and how to write, you know, RxJS. You can learn this from Joffer, who is a champion for it at Netflix. It's an awesome place to find sort of the authoritative course on various front-end topics. Also, plugging Wicked Good Ember, which is a conference in Boston 
that focuses on Ember, but also on sort of UI, JavaScript best practices in general. Um, what's exciting about this is Dockyard has recently hired Chris McCord, who wrote Phoenix, which is sort of like the rails for Elixir. So it seems like we might see something like a meteor-like thing coming with Ember meets Phoenix and things just sort of plug into each other. Um, so that should be pretty exciting for a like really performant, you know, full stack solution there. And then finally, just something that I've been using as a developer recently is debugging Node.js with Visual Studio Code. If you have not tried this, you've got to try it. NPM debug via the command line is something that I've just gritted my teeth with for way too long. And man, for some reason, I missed the boat on Visual Studio Code, having awesome tooling around this. I'm addicted to it. I'm never going back. It's fantastic. So definitely check that out. All right. Well, thank you, Mike. If people want to follow up, follow what you're doing, what are the best places to do that? Yeah. On Twitter, I'm Michael L. North. And on GitHub, I'm Mike Dash North. And that's basically it. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap this one up. Thank you again for coming, Mike. All right. Thanks for having me. We'll go ahead. Yeah, it was great to talk to you. Yeah. We'll catch everyone next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit c a c h e f l y dot com to learn more. Do you wish you could be part of the discussion on JavaScript Jabber? Do you have a burning question for one of our guests? Now you can join the action at our membership forum. You can sign up at javascriptjabber.com slash jabber, and there you can join discussions with the regular panelists and our guests. <laughs>